Let us go ahead and begin, and uh, I will open us in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and for your love. For us. We ask for your guidance and strength now. Give us understanding, ears to, to hear, and eyes to see. May we draw close to you, and may uh, we really take this time to understand what you've done for us in salvation, and maybe apply it to our heart and our hearts and also to our hands. May we use these truths to uh, serve others. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, good evening to everyone. And if I can ask for everyone to please mute their mics. So we're going to finish chapter one. We're going to finish Romans chapter one, verses 16 and 17, and the IT curriculum, uh, Christian, Christianity 101, chapter one, a word to be experienced. So this would be session two. And uh, I just have a brief PowerPoint just to, to review what we will be doing. And so just so that we really become familiar with the process with iTeam, that we're doing the, 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 three, the three components of learning. We, we're looking at uh, head knowledge. So we want to learn some truths. Uh, we want to learn various things. And then we don't want to end with the head. We want, we want to bring the head knowledge into our heart. So we're applying the knowledge that we gain in the Christian life. And just to review that, a Christian is, is an excellent name for who we are. We're Christ followers. People always want to choose different names. But, you know, if we're going to be Christ-centered, gospel-centered people, Christian is a great, a great uh, name to use. And so um, but we want the head to come into the heart. And, and we want to apply those truths in our Christian life. So in all areas of our life, we want to apply these things. And then the lastly is we want to then, uh, um, once our heart is transformed, once we're serving our families, our, our communities, then we want to also uh, serve the church. So uh, our, our first community is the church. Okay, so we want to be serving the church with our hands. So and this that, that's the vision of IT, uh, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And so those are the three components that we're learning. A uh, format for this course, just a quick review. We have the lectures, which are the group sessions. We also have the homework. We'll be discussing homework later tonight at the very end. You should have already discussed it in the small groups. But if you have a question, if you want to discuss something quickly, we can do that. Um, and then we have the, the group meetings for those who are meeting in, in local churches. And so that's the third component of, of the course. And then lastly is the mentor-mentee relationship. So um, those are the four, those are the four um, major parts of the course. So with, with this being said, I just want to briefly go over several forms that I actually posted on the group page. I just want to review those. Uh, this new form I'm going to be posting after class so everyone who's taking this course, whether you're auditing, remember auditing is just attending, participating, everything is optional. Everyone is more than welcome just to do that. We're not expecting anything from you other than to just be blessed. And maybe you can take some of the truths and apply it in your life in the church. But for everyone who's uh, 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 taking the class, whether, uh, whether for credit or for audit, I, I, the one requirement I have for the auditors is I want everyone to fill out this application. You don't have to do this for next week. By the time this semester draws to, or this class draws to a close, I would like everyone to, to have filled out an application and submitted it. Uh, and the purpose for that is that we can track, first off, we have a connection with you. Or we know who you are. There's information here that's helpful for, helpful to us on what, what teaching style works, what teaching style doesn't work, uh, language, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's really important for, for us to, for us as a, a future school, actually I should say future, present school that's growing, for everyone just to fill out this application. So just to, to, so that you can be aware, um, uh, application information, just right now all we're doing is iTeam, so you just would be applying for iTeam, and then you can see there that you're taking it either for audit or credit, so again, it's optional. Uh, I would like a picture of who you are so we can see who you are, and then um, 
your preference of learning, live Zoom, delayed video in class, and then just the language. So some people prefer English, some people prefer Warre Warre, maybe Tagalog. Just pick the, la the language that you prefer. And that's helpful to us, especially planning in the future, okay? And then personal information is just contact information for us. And so um, that also gives us a demographic of where the students are coming from, uh, where we, we have a lot of students, where we only have a, a few students. Um, church information, so this is helpful for us, especially if you're taking it for credit, that we have your, your pastor's contact information. So name of church, location, denomination later, Lord willing, we'll have more than just Baptists. And so uh, we want to be uh, uh, interdenominational, okay, because there's a lot of truths that we agree with. There's some, there's, there is some doctrine that we disagree with, but there's a lot that we agree with. And so we do want to reach out and to, and to help those if possible. And then just education background, if you attended college, if you attended graduate school, this is not related to necessarily to like Bible college. If you attended a, a four-year degree program, let's say it's nursing, engineering, whatever it is, just, just fill out the information for us. Um, and then uh, we do want to hear about your Christian experience, so your Christian testimony and involvement in church. So just describe your uh, conversion experience into the Christian faith. Um, have you received Trinitarian Protestant baptism? and just describe that experience for us. Um, how are you currently using your spiritual gifts in the church? So there's a spot, there's a spot to give us what, you, what you've been shown and what you believe your spiritual gift is and then how you're using it. And then also um, just some other questions here. And then um, uh, there's uh, just some character witnesses. Again, this is just for, this is standard actually. Every, every school that you would apply for requires this. And so if we're trying to be like a school, I mean, if we are a school, then uh, we should do this as well. And then lastly, just a signature and a date. Okay, so that's the first form. I will post that if you can fill it out sometime this semester and then take a picture. Um, if possible, if you could do a two by two or a four by four soft copy, that would be great. If you can't afford it, I understand. Have someone with a good smartphone just take the picture and then you can Facebook message it to me. Um, if you can take a picture at a place, I think it's like 60 or 70 pesos, uh, be helpful. And I just need a soft copy. I don't need any printouts, just a soft copy. You can bring your USB in and, and they can give it to you. Um, okay, just really quick, the other two applications I want us to, to show you very quickly. So first we have here is the Eastern Messiah School of Theology Weekly Student Report, okay? So you can fill this out by yourself or if you have a group, you can, uh, um, I want one person, the group leader, to fill this out, okay? So this is the way we'll take weekly attendance. This will be for your, your type of attendance. This will be your assignment, okay? And then small group, okay? So there's four things. Audit, credit, attendance, attendance of small group, and then assignment, okay? And this is very helpful to us. This is very helpful to us, especially if we're looking at live versus delayed. We wanna see who's able to attend, who's not able to attend, okay? And that's, that's, that's to help us planning in the future, how we can best help you. So um, one person should fill this out for, if you're by yourself, um, you, can, you can fill it out. Or you can just, if you're just by yourself, you can just Facebook message me. Um, I attended, I did the homework. Again, um, you don't have to do this if you're auditing, okay? So it's for those taking credit. Uh, but we need to do this on a weekly basis for record keeping as a school. It will be required for us in the future. So I will be looking for people if I can't find information. Um, uh, and then the next, uh, we have this form. This form, for, again, for those taking credit, this is the uh, bi-monthly mentor-mentee report, okay? Um, do not be intimidated by it. Don't be afraid. Um, this is to really help you and your mentor, if you're the disciple and the discipler, this is to help you to, to meet and then to talk about uh, 
and to grow spiritually. So we're not, this is not focused on theology, theology. You're not really supposed to be talking as much about that. We want to hear about your spiritual well-being, struggles, strengths. And so what we have here is just the, your name, the mentor's name, your ministry role in the church, your spiritual gifts. And then we have these, this number scale. So we're asking how is your spiritual holiness on a scale from one to seven? Seven being very good, one being I'm really struggling spiritually. You know, maybe you're engaged in sin, okay? Uh, physical discipline, um, your, your mental, how you're doing mentally, emotionally, in personal evangelism, in, in relationally, in daily devotional life. These numbers are, you, you write the number down and then you have the conversation with your mentor. I don't want to know the problems. Do not write down your problems or your struggles or your strengths, okay? The purpose of this is it, you write down a two and then your mentor will be like, why did he put two? Capitan, why did you write two? And then you can talk. You can, you can talk. Oh, you, you put a seven. Oh, you know, why did you put a seven? And then it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an, uh, a segue into talking, to talking points, okay? But I don't want you to write down any personal sins. I don't want you to write down. That's between you and your mentor. That's between you and your church, okay? Your spiritual health is between you and your church. But we do need to be tracking, since the curriculum is focusing on head, heart, hands, we do, we do need to be able to, at the end of this curriculum, say, yes, we took care of the head, the heart, and the hands. <laughs> okay, so this is why we do have to have some form of report. And the other thing too is that you're also really meet, meeting on a regular basis. Now the expectation is once every two months, okay? So trust me, once every two months is a lot, okay? So I don't want you meeting every week. I don't want you meeting every month. I want every other month, okay? It's just once a month is too much and you won't have everything, you won't have anything to talk about, okay? Um, and then down here, these, you can share details, but you don't have to. But this is just what was a great victory I had, what was a battle I had. Um, and then if you have a question you're wrestling with theologically or doctr doctrinally or ministerially, and you want to ask the question, write the question down, and then you can discuss with your pastor. And, um, and it, again, it's, it's to help facilitate uh, the relationship, okay? And again, I don't want personal information down unless you want to share. If you want to share, that's fine. I do want to say lastly that, uh, okay, so there are instructions here when I send this out. But the last thing I do want to say is that, um, is that this is very confidential, okay? So no one will, will see this. We won't share this with anyone. The educational, the institution, and the student relationship is confidential, okay? So... So we will not be sharing this information, okay, with anyone else, all right? So let's just quickly go back to the PowerPoint. We'll just finish here, and then we'll go back in the text. Um, and so I, I hope that I'll put this back on the, the, the group page, and it will always be there for you to, to, pull, to pull off. Um, quick overview of the lecture. Our objective, we're finishing from last week, to be familiar with the following concepts related to salvation and a passage of scripture for each one. So again, chapter one has many different concepts related to salvation, okay? And so we're just trying to, to, focus, it, to focus it for you. Um, the topics that we're finishing our discussion are salvation, God, wrath, judgment, conversion, and baptism. So these were the topics in chapter one. And then I did add... Um, Three other topics, because they're actually part of it. It's not different. So the gospel, faith, and repentance. And our primary text is Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Okay? And then at the very end of, at the very end of this lecture tonight, we'll review the homework if you have any questions or anything of that nature. Okay. At this point, let's go ahead and let's, Dive right back in the text. So if you have your Bibles, please turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. The word of the Lord says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation 
to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Okay, I just want to quickly review from last week and we will, we will uh, go into new material. Last week, we really unpacked the idea of the gospel, the good news, and we identified 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 as the primary text that really gives us a very concise um, a very concise definition of the gospel. It's Christ dying for our sins. And so um, we have this idea of Christ dying for our sins as this substitute. Our sins are given to Christ, and later tonight we'll see that, our, that Christ's righteousness is given to us, okay? And so Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and he was raised again in accordance with the scriptures. And so that's a great, that's a great description of what the gospel is. We also compared and looked at uh, Christ, um, uh, his description of the gospel in Romans 1, 1 to 4. And we saw how the accent was really on the resurrection of, of, from the dead and this public declaration of who Christ is. And that's great news because if Christ is raised from the dead as the new creation, as the Superman, <laughs> I, I actually really like that word, the, the, the Superman, the firstborn of the dead in this incorruptible state, we have assurance of the same if it's shown that we are in Christ, if it is shown that we are in union with Christ. Okay, so Romans 1, 1 to 4 is very close. It's complementary to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. The next thing we looked at is this idea of um, actually the power of God, the power of God. And so uh, Henry brought up the really gr profound truth that Paul, Paul experienced the power of God, and it transformed him. That wasn't in my notes, but I, I really, I really like that description, and that, and that, that probably partially, in a big part, goes into this idea of why he's not ashamed, because Paul has experientially uh, been transformed. It's an experience that he himself has has experienced. Um, and the other thing we brought out was that this power is. What kind of power, power is it? It's a literal power. It's a, it's, it's a creative power. And it's also this resurrection power. That's the kind of power we're talking about. It's not figurative. It's not, we're not talking metaphorically. Um, it's literal. And it's, and it's yes. incredible. Go ahead. Uh, Pastor Jerry, you want to make a comment? Uh, what's the original, the Greek word for, is it dunamis hmm. or power? Dunamis, yep. Dunamis. Uh, let me confirm that first. Yes, dunamis. That's correct. Good observation. Anyone else want to make a comment or ask a question? Okay, great. And then, and then we talk about what this salvation is. And so we, we, we define salvation in agreement with the I-team curriculum that it's deliverance from impending death. Okay, and there's, there's two deaths. There's two deaths in the New Testament. There's physical and spiritual. So Jesus will say things like, don't worry about him who can kill the flesh but can't destroy the body in hell. Fear him who can destroy both, both body and hell, uh, both body and spirit in hell. Okay, so there's, there's two deaths. And, and in Revelation, there's uh, the promise that those who that are in Christ will never be hurt by the second death. Those that partake in the, the, the first resurrection will never be hurt by the second death. And so, and that's the same, that's the same in Romans. It's this, there's a physical death and there's also a, like an eternal death. Uh, meaning, I mean to say separation from God, uh, separation from God. And then, and then we did talk about here, uh, Let's go, let's go, Romans 3, 10, and 12, 10 to 12, and verse 20. What is the condition of man? We did not answer that. Did, did you discuss, and did you really discuss that in your, when you discussed, and you did the homework? Did you look up Romans 3, 10? Let's go there. Let's go to Romans 3, 10, and we can discuss it. I, I'm sure you probably discussed it. You're probably familiar with it. 
But let's go there. I, I want to discuss this passage. The, the condition of mankind. The condition of mankind. Let's go to Romans chapter 3, verses 10, okay? I'll begin in verse 9, okay? Let's, I'm actually going to read the 10 verses. And, and as I read, you have your assignments there that you, that you looked at. But as I read, I want you to be thinking about, because people have different views on, on humanity. I want us to be looking at, the question that we're looking at right now is, so we're looking at this, the condition of man, okay? As I read here, my question is, what is, how does Paul describe the condition of man? And specifically, I'm looking for internal things and out and external things, okay? How does he describe our condition, okay? And let me go ahead and read, and you can follow along. And let's answer this question. I want to ask, how bad is man? How bad is man? Verse 9, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged, so this is a courtroom setting. They're, they're, the prosecution has brought the charge, the accusation. Both Jews and Greeks are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps or snakes is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. What? So that every mouth may be stopped. The whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. That is the most the strongest, the strongest description of man's condition in all of Scripture. This is so powerful. Let's go back. Let's highlight. I'm going to highlight, okay? No one, none is righteous. Not one. So th this is like, this is like a, a clarification here. So no one, is, no one is righteous. Well, are you sure? Yes, not even one, okay? Now watch this though, okay? So we so when we're talking about righteous though, this is typically debat, this is outward. If we're talking about if we're talking about righteous, right, are you righteous before the law of the Philippines? That's outward. Debat, there's no uh, there's no typically when you talk about righteous, there's no um, uh, thought crime. Okay. Now of course in God's standard there is, but here we can just say, oh, maybe that's outward. Maybe no one is righteous outwardly. But watch, inward, no one understands, no one seeks God. I'm a good person, no you're not. Number five, all, so we have these words, none, no one, not one, no one. All have become worthless. Number seven. No one does good. <laughs> Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. This is very offensive. This is, this is now becoming offensive, Diva. Before, you're, before you were converted, would you acknowledge that this was your condition? Yes, yeah. sir, Tim. Go ahead. Uh, uh, if you notice, it is indented. Yeah. Uh, from verses 
So this is a quotation from the Old Testament? Yes, Tava, Tava from the Psalms, yeah. Okay. If, if, we, if we were going deep, we would go look at those passages. No, I'm just uh, no. curious. No, Pastor Jerry made an excellent observation. If I was preaching this, if I was doing a Bible lesson, you should go to the, to the Old Testament. You should go to the Old Testament and explore. So great observation, um, Pastor Jerry. Th that's correct. We really should do that. This is offensive here. Our throat is an open grave. One offense. Two, they use their tongues to deceive. The, the venom of asps is on their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Think about this. This is all the mouth. This is, this is all the mouth. Think about that. We tend to minimize speech. The big sins are adultery. The big sins are uh, murder, okay? But look at this. In, in, in the listing of big sins, this is all speech. This is all speech. Speech is a very big deal for God. The word of mouth, it can kill a person. Yes. Yes. Yes, and, and, and there's examples of, of um, in Corinthians, they, uh, so, uh, an, an, un, uh, a brother that is engaged in adultery, we're told not to associate with them. And you know what the sin that's labeled right next to, to, to adultery? Sexual immorality? Verbal abuser. Verbal abuser. So, so our mouth can kill, and it's just as serious in the eyes of God. Um, number five, now, now we we're talking about, uh, about violence, physical violence. Their paths are uh, full, uh, full of ruin and misery. There is no fear of God before their eyes, okay? Um, and, and we can unpack this more. I don't want to I don't want to spend time, a lot of time here. But what I want to emphasize is when you're talking, taking someone through the gospel, of all, there's a lot of different passages, even in chapter one. I would just go here. Just go to this passage and just say, do you accept this reality? This is what the word of God is saying about me. This is what the word of God is saying about you. Do you accept that? Um, and when they get angry, this is not me. I did not write this. This has been written for, two thousand, for over 2,000 years, and it's in the Old Testament and the New Testament, okay? So I, I would take people to that. And, and here, look here. Um, this, this, this concept here, both Jews and Greeks, echoes our passage, right? Jews and Greeks. So this would be righteous. This would be sinners in, in a Jewish person, but this is... This is like the best, right? This is the worst. All are under sin. <laughs> so we have the best and the worst. If the best and the worst is under sin, everything in between, okay? So that's all I will say there. Um, but just to really emphasize, this will not, what, what, when you share the gospel and someone says, I'm a good person, this is where they, 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 that they should be confronted. Because this is a, a contradiction to someone who's saying they're they're good. Okay. Any comments or question, questions? Can I, okay. And um, you know, in sharing the gospel, uh, you know, you know, we believe in Jesus Christ. We are right, we are declared righteous, righteous, right? Yes. And um, this refers to in the eyes of God before. Those who have not trusted Jesus Christ. So, my question is, since we are only righteous in the eyes of God by faith, then how do we share that one? Are we using the pronoun, the plural pronoun? Uh, we, no, we are sinners. So, so, for, so for me, what I, what I, when you're sharing the gospel, okay, you, you do want to be clear that there. 
you were you were one way you experienced and were transformed um by the power of god and now you're different okay so you want to make that clear some people will just say no we're always the same it's only a transaction we're just as bad sinners after conversion as before. That's a theology out there. And, and I would, I would want to put that because we should be sharing how the Lord has transformed our lives. And we should not ever take credit for it. We would say, I, I put my complete faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He made me a new person. He, he, he gave me a new birth and he put my, his spirit in me. So now I am not the same as I was but I'm not perfect, but anything good I do, it's because of him. So you should make that clarification clear, Pastor Gary. Uh, come again. Uh, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, when I see someone with the gospel, when I say, you know, we are sinners, or you are sinner, because I only trusted in Jesus Christ, I'm righteous before his eyes, but this person is not a believer. So my question is, how do we, use the he said are we using the pronoun you you are a sinner and or we are sinners in the sense that because we don't want to offend the person yeah no, so, but that's what i'm saying so i would say we would use the pronoun um pronoun. We, you could use we, we. you could use we okay. yeah that, that that's completely fine but what so i'm not absolutely but what I want to do is I want to, I want to, when I share the gospel, I want, in sharing the gospel, I want to share my experience. I want to share my, my state before conversion, the mm -hmm. transformation. I want to share what the gospel has done for me. And then I want to put before them the word of God in Christ and let that word confront them. It's the word of God that will confront and, and, con and convict, not me. So, so, so. Where we don't want to offend is, you know, I, I will not say, um, I, I would not typically say you should do this. Or I say like, you know, I will not leave, put my name in there. I will always say the word of God says this. Uh, uh, this is what, this is what Jesus says. I, I would be, I would really separate myself from the word of God. I don't know if that's making sense. Is that making sense with what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because in the u.s they're like with the homosexual thing you know i wouldn't say like i would say i don't believe i don't believe that homosexuality is 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 right not because because it's my opinion but because the word of god says so can i just read the word of god to you and, and then maybe you can give me a different interpretation and when you whenever you read it's kind of like then they're like arguing they start arguing with the word <laughs> they're not arguing with you anymore so uh, or or um with with for example, confronting someone with, with being good, I would not say you're a bad person. I would say this is what the word of God says about all of us. And then okay. read it. So we have that's the authority. Always other than saying Yeah, always put it you always want to pull yourself away. You we, at my work in the US, we'd always say, Don't shoot the messenger. You have a problem with corporate. If there's like a bill problem, they're, they're like, you know, I, no, no, no. it's like, no, no, no. I'm just, I'm just sharing with you. Call, call accounting, <laughs> call finance. I'm just sharing with you that your bill is late and you have a late fee like that. <laughs> yeah. Because what will happen, Pastor Jerry, because I've, I've done a lot of evangelism, especially in the U.S. And what happens is, is that when, when you, when you're saying I, or you're talking, it all of a sudden becomes you and them. You're fighting with them, and you always want to, you want to push it away and say, well, "Well, this is what the Word of God says." Like maybe you have a, how are you? And typically they look at that and then they get angry. They get angry at the Bible. That's that was that's been my experience. If you read them, the text would say like, "This is what Jesus says." It really kind of it pulls you away from it. Great question, though. Anyone observation, observation about yeah. In verse 10, it says, as it is written. Yeah. So when we share, when we share, the opinion is not coming from us. It comes from as it is written. So it is Jesus who's saying. 
So when we share, when we share uh, the gospel of salvation to an uh, unbeliever, for me, I would bring him or bring that person to this, what did God say about us? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Yes, I agree. Yeah. It is, uh, it is not a debatable. It is how God look at us. Yeah. Because as it is written. Yeah. And, and what you can even emphasize is this is, this is, this is actually OT. And then the writing is the new T. So you can say it's always been like that. It was in it with the Jews and it's with us with Paul. You know, people will say Old Testament bad, New Testament, God is love. It's like, no, no, no. Old Testament, it is written. And now, they're, and now Paul is quoting it in the New Testament. It's the same. But absolutely, I would, I would highlight, I like what Pastor, Pastor Henry is saying. I would highlight this. It is written. This is... Um, yeah, it's good. It's really good. So uh, this is presuming that someone whom we are sharing the gospel uh, believes the Bible. The the Bible is the word of God. It, it is presuming. And I think for the yeah. most part, in talk Lobon, most would agree that the word of God is inspired, Diba. Most would agree. In general. Yeah. So. And that's why, I mean, unless you really knew someone that was like an atheist or rejected the scripture, that's actually easy for you because they already hold to the word of God. Um, the one other thing I would say in evangelism is, um, if at all possible, try to have a relationship with the person before you share the gospel with them. Um, I have found if you share the gospel cold the first time you meet someone, it is so hard. And then they become angry, and then it's done. What, what I would do is, I, in Kavitha, I had a, an expatriate um, from Europe, and uh, um, an expat, an expat. Very anti, very anti uh, God. I waited like three or four months before I shared the gospel with him. And when I shared it with him, of course, we actually went back and forth. But we were, we were friends, and I, he, did not, he did not believe. And I, but I was able to share... Uh, we talked a long time. We would talk after the fact. I would still have coffee with him, and it was great. I, I am convinced if the first time I had just shared the gospel with him, he would have closed up, and we would not have had a relationship. Um, and so I, I, not always you have to really as assess, but if, if you meet someone, don't share the first time. Build a relationship, and then look for the opportunity, and it will go much farther than, than just the first time. Good. All right. Let, let, let's go back to the text. I, I don't want to, I didn't want to spend too much time on that. It's, it's a little bit of time here. Um, uh, so then, so then coming here now, uh, after looking at that, uh, all of us stand guilty. We're all facing the wrath of God. So we talked about the wrath of God and Romans 5, 8 is literally, we will be saved from the wrath of God. And then we also looked at who God is. Okay. So that's the review from last week. So let's, let's, let's finish here tonight, clauses or lines. And so um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. I just want to emphasize here that to the Jew first and also to the Greek, this is just emphasizing salvation is for all. Okay. Now this... This might be like for us, oh, of course we know that. But for a Jew, it would not have been. For, for a Jew, it would have been very offensive for the Jewish Messiah to be now given to the Gentiles. You, that doesn't happen, okay? So this is, a, this is a very radical statement to a first century Jew, okay? Um, that the gospel is universal, that, 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 that Yahweh, the, the Lord of the Israelites is saving everyone. That would have been radical, although it's all over the Old Testament. You know, so I'm not saying that it's not in the Old Testament. It's just they had a bad interpretation, okay? So, um, uh, but here, this is accented. That, that the, the only condition, the only condition is this, okay? The one who believes. Okay, 
Now I do wanna I do wanna draw your attention to to one repetitive word in this context. The repetitive word is belief. It happens here uh, four times. Okay. This is actually the same word, okay? It's the same word being used, um, just a verb form and then a noun form, okay? So it's the same word, all right? So the only condition for salvation, the only condition, look, look here, look here. There is only uh, uh, one condition to receive this, correct? Believing. So this would be an excellent text to challenge a Catholic who works as, who is to say, oh, well, you need baptism as well. Oh, you need, you need to do these things. You need the sacraments. You, you need the sacraments in order to, to, um, to, to be fully, to receive all grace, right? No. One, for the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, period. Okay. Now we're going to further unpack. We're going to further unpack this this idea of of faith. Okay. We're going to unpack it in the next verse. Okay. So at this point, let's just shelf. Let's just put it on hold. Okay. So then, so then, what we have here is we have this explanation number two, Diba. Explanation number two. Uh, for in it, what is the it? It, it, or in, in, inside that salvation. Yeah, so my. Uh, it's a pronoun, uh, so yeah, noun, pronoun that is hidden, a noun that is hidden, the request to gospel, right? Yes. I heard it, gospel. So, it, it. So actually, if you're looking here, there's only two repetitive words. Uh, faith and gospel. Gospel's three times and faith is four times, okay? So if we're looking at repetitive words, those are primary. This is the topic, okay? So for in the gospel, and, and looking here just to really highlight, the reason, why, the reason why I'm saying explanation is because of this key word here, for, okay? Now, for in it, the righteousness is revealed. The righteousness of God is revealed. Think about that for a second. So we have this action here. This is revelation, okay? God is revealing something to us, okay? And the object of revelation is the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. Okay. In in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Now, this we're gonna go a little bit deep here, but you also look you you looked in your you look you had the same assignment in chapter one. So I'm not going too deep because you had it in chapter one. Okay. So let's go back. Let's go back to um uh Keep in your mind this phrase, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, okay? So there's a connection here. Let's just make a connection here. Um, does everyone see how faith is connected with the righteousness, okay? For in the gospel, 
the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. Okay, so these two are inseparable. Biba, tamaba, they're connected. Okay, so let's go back to Romans chapter 3. So we saw the pinnacle of, of, of man's failure in Romans chapter 3. And I would suspect, I would suspect where the pinnacle of man's failure is also the pinnacle of the gospel. Uh, so let's look here. When I'm saying pinnacle, the high point. Okay, so at the high point of man's failure, we're going to see the high point of the gospel as well. So we're coming back to Romans chapter 3, verse 20, okay? So we ended it in verse 20 right here. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin, okay? What about verse 21? <laughs> Look at this. Before I read it, I'm going to put a, another word in here. I don't know why they use manifested. I'm just irritated with that. I am disappointed by my, I am disappointed by my, my favorite version, ESV. I am disappointed, Scion. It should, be, it, should have been, it should have been revealed. It used to be revealed. They changed it in this edition. Why? I don't know. Yeah, they changed it. I don't know why they changed it, Scion. Uh, Made known, revealed. Okay, so watch this. Here we go. I'm going to read verse 21. This, this, this is the truth by which we, this is the truth by which we had the Protestant Reformation. If this truth was not discovered, we would still be Catholic. <laughs> by the grace of God, we are not. And Martin Luther discovered this. But now the righteousness of God has been revealed apart from the law, although the law and the prophets testify to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness in the present time so that he might be the just, he might be both just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So here we have righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, okay? There's two components here. I'm only going to highlight one because this is not, we're, we're doing basics, okay? We're not going deep. The one component here, the fundamental component is that God's righteousness, right? Um, this is, uh, this is um, um, the state of being in the right. Divine righteousness is the state of being in the right. God's righteousness is credited to our account, okay? In, Ro in Romans chapter 4, he explains that. So, so in 1 Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, Diba, Christ died for our sins. So, so uh, our sins are credited to Christ. He takes our sins and he dies for us, Diba. Well, here, Christ gives us, uh, his righteousness is credited to us. Okay? So I'm just going to draw a picture here. Let's do it. Let's do it here. So when he's talking about from faith for faith, and then we go to Romans 3, 21 and following, what's happening here is, let's just do this. You have the cross, and then this is mankind, okay? Our sin is given, and it's paid for on the cross, okay? 
But Christ's righteousness is credited to us. They call this the great exchange. Christ takes our sin, we receive Christ's righteousness, okay? This is one fundamental component to what, it, what is referred to as the righteous, righteousness of God being revealed from faith for faith, okay? Some people will say it's, it's faith from, from, from first to last. We have the example of Abraham, and he, he expresses faith, and now in the New Testament, we're still ex ex expressing faith. Others will talk about, well, no, it's, it's God has been faithful, and now we have to have faith in God. Okay, so whatever it is, the bottom line is that what makes this possible is faith. What makes this happen is faith. Is, let me take a step back. Is everyone tracking with me? Let's ask a question. I don't want to rush this. Um, this. This is brought into clarity when we, when we go to Romans 3, 21 and following, okay? I want to be crystal clear on that. Um, this phrase, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, is literally repeated in Romans 321. And so he expounds upon what he means by uh, 117 in 321 and following. Okay. So is, let me take a moment, just think about it, ask a question. Let's just take a moment. I don't want to rush here. Someone ask a question. I, if I'm not making sense, please ask a question. I, I want I want to be clear here. Uh so Tim. Yeah, go ahead. And in verse 17, it says, uh, For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, uh, is, is, is this related to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7? Uh, yes. Let me, um, just, let me just make sure that I have what you're thinking of is what I'm thinking of, because uh, I believe so, though. Uh, First, uh, you said, what did you say, 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. Yeah, is that, is yes. that related? So that would be the righteous shall live by faith. That would be, a, that would be Paul is thinking in the mm. same concept. Yeah. Okay, let's go on here. So from faith for faith. So what I want us to see here is as far as this understanding, though, okay, is everyone tracking with me concerning... Uh, concerning this great exchange. Everyone is tracking with me on there, okay? Everyone's tracking. Yes. Okay, good. And, and, and um, the debate concerning from faith for faith, um, some people say it's uh, God's faith, that's from faith, and then it's also our faith, Others will say um, it's uh, from beginning uh, to end, okay? Meaning to say Abraham was saved by faith, we are saved by faith. It's always been faith, okay? Um, I like both. <laughs> I think there's really a truth that God has to be faithful he has to be faithful to his covenant, and we must exercise faith in order for the righteousness of God to be revealed. And it's really true. In Romans chapter 4, Abraham saved by faith. And so, you know, we could debate this till the, cal till the end of time. Let's just make the statement, by faith. The em Let's say this. The, the emphasis is faith. The emphasis here is faith. Okay? Everyone understand that? The emphasis yeah. is faith? Yeah. Yes. Let's, 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 let's just say that, okay? Now, 
the question that we want to ask here, we're, we're, we're drawing to, to a conclusion here. The question that I want to ask is, uh, uh, what, what kind of faith? What kind of faith? Okay. Uh, the, faith, the kind of faith that is revealed by God. So it's revealed by God. And so let's, let's try to quantify it. Let's, let's ask some questions here. Is it a one-time faith? We're asking this question right now. Is it, a, is it only a belief in a fact? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, what kind of faith is it? Okay. We can say here, um, this clarifies the kind of faith. Does everyone see that? The righteous shall live by faith. That's a lifestyle, Diba. So this here, what I want us to see here is this is a lifestyle. Okay, and what I want us to see here is there are several things that there has to be true for this faith. Um, and I'm going to show you an example. Number one, it should be, it should be uh, a belief in a truth. So, for example, we believe that Jesus rose from the dead. That's a fact, Diva. So there should be belief. There should be trust. And then number three, there should be... Um, uh, obedience. Okay. And we're, we're going to be drawing our evening to a close after we discuss baptism. But what I want us to see here is let, let's just go to several passages for, for ob the obedience component. Let's go to Romans one, five, and then, well, even for here, we can go to, um, uh, Romans chapter 4, verses 16 to 25. Okay. Romans 1, 5, and then Romans 4, 16 to 25. So this is defining for us faith. What this faith looks like. Okay, so let's just go quickly to Romans. Look, look here. Uh, Everyone can see this. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Okay. So there is a sense of faith that is obe it's obedient. Okay. Um, I'm not talking about the act of obedience separate. If you, if you were to say, um, I'm, I'm focusing specifically on, uh, we are called to have faith. We are called to have faith. And so for us to trust, there is, there is an obedience component, okay? So positively, we're called to obey, the, uh, to believe the gospel. Negatively, Paul will say um, in Romans chapter 10, they did not all obey the gospel, <laughs> positively believe, negatively obey, okay? Because uh, if we're called to have faith, there is an obedient component, Diba. There's an obedient component. So I do want us to see that. Because Diba, people will say, I believe in God, Diba. They will say, I believe in God. I believe that God exists. But they haven't actually uh, submitted to God. They haven't actually submitted to God. So this here is, it's, uh, when we trust in Christ, when we trust in the promises of God, we are submitting to the will of God. Let's go to one other passage of scripture. 
just again, we really want, we're just trying to define, we're trying to define this idea of faith. Um, Romans chapter four in verse 16. Now I'm just going to read this and you can read this on your own time, but this is, a, this is an excellent description of faith. Again, if I have one passage to describe what faith is, I'm going to go here, okay? Uh, this is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he would become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which is as good as dead, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. This is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours. <laughs> so it will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses, and watch, delivered for our trespasses, raised for our righteousness. So here we have the great exchange. Great exchange here. Look at this. Trespasses, justification, or this is righteousness. Great exchange. <laughs> um, but the point I want us, let, let's just go back here and highlight, okay, really quick here. What is the fact? He, number one, he believed that God had the power to call things into existence that did not exist and life from the dead. This is a fact. He believed in facts. This is who God is. So when we have saving faith, one component is that we believe in the resurrection. The resurrection happened. We believe in who God is. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, so we're, we're, believing, uh, we're believing in facts about a reality, okay? But it's more than just saying God exists. That's part of it, but it's more than that. It's also this idea of no unbelief made him waver. This is trust here. This is trust. He trusted in the promises of God. Diba? So not only is there belief, but there's also trust. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. And then, of course, um, there's obedience, right? So he is... Uh, in trusting, there's also this obedient component, okay? Uh, so there, there is two types of faith here. One is the first, it's a one-time faith, which is in the belief of God in verse... 17? Yeah, 17. And a continuing faith, that's another kind of faith. Yes. That's so, so, yeah, we would say this, this is intellectual, Kapatid. Uh, uh, yeah. He believes in a fact about God. So it's one time. It's, I just accept that that's a reality. But then, no, you're right. There's this, there's this living faith. This comes back to the righteous shall live by faith. 
Abraham is the example here, right? Look, he grew strong in his faith, fully convinced. No belief was, no belief made him waver, okay? So, so this, this is the explanation of from faith or faith. Yes, yes, yes. Tama, tama. And, and so what some people will say from faith is describing Abraham as the first, the first like the, the example of faith, and then us, right? So this is what, so the word, so the key here is this. It, not just for him, us. From faith, for faith. Abraham was the first. We are the, now, in reality, really Noah had faith. Okay, so even, so it's not, he's not saying Abraham was the first ever to have faith. But what he's trying to say is that in the Abrahamic, the Abrahamic promises, the promise of, of the Jews was always by faith. That's what he's trying to make the argument. He's trying to make the argument, okay? But for our purposes, from faith is Abraham, for faith, us. Others will say, no, from faith is God's faith, his, his faithfulness to Abraham, his faithfulness to us, and then us, we have to have faith in God. And so what I'm trying to say is, yes, 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 <laughs> yes. So, so coming back here, this defines here, Okay. And, and the reason why this is the case here is because of this. Okay. So the righteous is in fact someone who is in union with Christ. Did you see that? That's why it's the righteous shall live by faith. Okay. The truly righteous one shall live by faith. And this is this whole concept here of of union with Christ. And we're going to close tonight on this union with Christ, okay? And we're going to close now uh we're going to close now on baptism, okay? We're going to close on baptism. Let's go in our Bibles to Romans chapter 6. You had to look at Romans chapter 6 verses 1 to 40, ba? Union with Christ. We must be saturated with this truth. Union with Christ. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know, brothers, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized? So this is, this is the first idea. Baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. So we are one with him. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Verse 5. For we have been united with him, <laughs> united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified on the cross with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. If we have died with Christ, we also, that we, we also believe that we will live with him. And we can just go on. I mean, this is all over the place. It's all over Romans. Union with Christ. And we don't really talk about this. Mungo Kapitid, listen to me. Our assurance, this is our primary assurance, okay? How do we know that we will be in heaven? Because we are in union by faith with Christ Jesus. 
How do we know? Because if we are clinging to Jesus in faith, Sigurado, we will be in heaven with him. If we have been united in a death like his, have we? Yes. Therefore, we will be united. So look at this. Look at this. This is, this is the reality. Promise. Is this true? Yes. Then the second is true. We want to say yes. Therefore, must be true. So when we talk about uh, assurance of salvation, how can I know? Now there's other proofs. So I don't want to, I don't want to minimize other proofs. And then there's, there can be self-deceit where people have a false conversion. Fair enough. Okay. Um, but, but for someone who has genuine saving faith, they have the faith of Abraham. They're living by faith. Our assurance is not in our own works. It's not in our own righteousness. It's in this union with Christ. If we have been united with him in death, we will be united with him in resurrection. Yeah, this is, this is the, the grace of God in us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, great. Um, let's go ahead and end end tonight um were there questions were there questions on the homework there was a couple words that were when i looked at the homework that were hard to understand and so i do want to highlight them here but did anyone have any questions anyone from the homework or it was pretty much people understood okay so what i'll do is i'll just highlight these words and then if you have a question if something comes to mind you can bring it up but i i, I did just want to highlight some words so uh, just key, key words to be thinking about. We've defined this, but salvation is deliverance from death, both physical and more importantly, spiritual death. Okay. So when we talk about salvation, that's a Christianese term. It's like, what does that mean? Always be thinking deliverance from death, Sp uh, physical and spiritual. Okay. So even in our study, we saw this, I this idea of justification. Okay. That's a big word. It's in the scriptures if you're reading, but it literally is just declared righteous, declared righteous. Okay. And so this is when Christ gives us uh, his righteousness. So whenever you see justification, think Christ giving us um, his righteousness. Now, technically the, the justification is uh, um, on God's final judgment day. He will declare us righteous uh, guilty or or righteous okay that future that future verdict has been brought into the present so in romans 5 1 having therefore been justified through faith we have peace with god so justification the, the last day a uh, 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 verdict guilty righteous okay that has been brought into the present. So that's what we mean by justification, okay? Declared to be righteous. Next, this word, I think this was in 1 John 4, 19 and 20. Uh, propitiation, propitiation. Propitiation, is a, it was also in Romans 3, 21. So this is a very big word, okay? Whenever you see this word, don't be, don't be stressed, don't be upset or scared. Literally, it means it has two meanings. The removal of God's wrath, or God is made favorable towards us, and it's also the cancellation of sin. So, uh, if Christ is our propitiation for our sin, He cancels our sin. Uh, uh, he's also the propitiation of the Father, or to the Father. I don't know how you say that. That is that He makes the Father favorable towards us. Okay. So always, when you see that big word, it's in, it was in uh, 1 John 4, 19 to 20. It's in Romans 3, 21, I think 3, 24. I could be mistaken there, but in that passage. Um, and then it's also in Hebrews chapter 2, and I think one or two other places. But just think, removal of the wrath of God, God is now favorable towards us. 
Uh, he's gracious towards us now, and also he cancels our sin. Um, this other word here, uh, uh, substitutionary atonement, is just this big exchange. Our sin given to Christ, Christ's righteousness given to us. Okay? So important. And the reason why substitutionary atonement is so important is that Catholic theology says that Christ just wipes the slate clean. He, 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 he wipes it all away, but you still have to earn it moving forward, okay? So they call like infused righteousness. He gives you some righteousness, but not enough. That's why you have to go to purgatory, so you can be further cleansed. But Protestant uh, understanding of atonement is our sin is imputed to Christ, and Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. And of course, union with Christ. Union with Christ. Just think of a marriage. <laughs> Just think of a marriage. Uh, we are in mari marriage with Christ by faith, in which all of Christ's benefits are given to us. If we were united with him in death, we will be united with him in resurrection. If he reigns, we will reign. If he lives, we will live. If he receives the promises, we receive the promises. So Paul says, uh, in Christ Jesus are all the promises of God find their yes <laughs> and amen. So just think, union with Christ. We want to be in union with Christ. And the rest is history. If there's anything else, lastly. But it's an idea of changing the mind. Changing the mind. <laughs> So until we really, someone cannot have saving faith, there's debate what comes first, repentance or faith. What we can say is in order for us to be saved, um, if repentance is a turning of the mind and faith is clinging to Christ, both must be present, okay? Um, many people talk about repentance as being within faith. So regardless, there has to be this changing of the mind. So someone who says, I believe in Jesus, Okay, do you want to give up your sin? No, I love my sin too much. I love my sin too much. Okay, then you, have, you don't have saving faith. Okay, so someone has to be not saying they're going to give up their faith, but that they have to be willing and committed to giving up their sin. I'm sorry, giving up their sin, not giving up their faith. Okay? And then lastly, faith. There's just three components. There's this belief, there's this trust, there's this obedience to God as revealed in Christ Jesus. And so we can say it's, um, I like what Henry said, intellectual, and then also this living faith, this growing faith, okay? But there must be belief. We believe that Christ exists, that God exists, that Christ was raised from the dead. There was a literal resurrection. We are trusting in the promises of God, and we are, are submitting to the Lordship of Jesus. We are submitting to the Lordship of Jesus, okay? And, and this is our salvation. I mean, this is, this is the foundation by which we stand, um, by which we are being saved, if we hold fast, okay? So just uh, in closing, um, uh, for next week, go ahead and work on chapter two. We'll work on chapter two in class next week. So your assignment is chapter two of the Christianity Course 101. And then if you can meet with your group to discuss, that would be great. And then... Um, Prepare any questions you have from your homework if you have. Again, maybe you don't have, and, and it should be self-explanatory. If you, if you do the homework and you're accompanying that with the, the, the lecture, and then, of course, your leaders are also asking questions, it should be self-explanatory. It's not, it's not really, really difficult. We're, we're dealing with foundational things. I'll, I'll, I'll open it up. Any questions, any comments, any thoughts? Okay, great. Um, it's late, and thank you for your patience. We'll close in prayer. Is um, uh, Pastor June, can you close us in prayer, please? Okay. Uh, can we pray? <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Jesus, uh, for uh, another uh, opportunity that we are able to uh, discuss uh, your word. And thank you, Pastor, for Pastor Jim, who lead us in uh, this Bible study. This uh, uh, 
training Lord so that uh, we are able to train also others. Lord, we pray that you will continue to bless us and bless this um, um, ministry and this also our ministry, Father. And uh, we commit all these things to you, Father. Even tonight, as we uh, go to sleep, give us a uh, good rest and uh, protect us, uh, Lord, from any harm. So we commit all these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm.